It is an honor and a very precious privilege to have the opportunity of worshiping with you today. I have been blessed by the warmth of your welcome, the sincerity and enthusiasm of your praise in singing this morning, and in the reports about your engagement in the mission of God. Wherever I travel in the world, the best time and the best place is always Sabbath morning. It seems that it is when we worship that we have a sense of the highest things in common and the most things in common. And I would like to think with you this morning about the church and the mission of God. And to give some fuel to our imagination and our thinking in moments to come, I would invite you to hear a passage of Scripture written originally by the Apostle Paul and recorded in the book of Ephesians. But I would like to share it with you from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. This is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. This is the way Peterson translates it. When it came to presenting the message to people who had no background in God's way, I was the least qualified of any of the available Christians. God saw to it that I was equipped, but you can be sure that it had nothing to do with my natural abilities. And so, here I am, preaching and writing about things that are way over my head, the inexhaustible riches and generosity of Christ. My task is to bring out in the open and make plain what God, who created all this in the first place, has been doing in secret and behind the scenes all along. Through Christians like yourselves, gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. Now, in this passage, which is typical of Paul's writing to other churches of his time, he speaks about the marvel of his calling and identifies once again the compass points for his living. It is as though the call of God has become the magnetic north pole for all that he does and how he does it. So he speaks in this passage about the purpose of his living. And he leads to also talk about the purpose of the church. That's what I would like to think with you about for a few moments. What is the purpose of the church? You know, often our thoughts and our expressions about the church are rather personal and rather casual. It's a building on the landscape. It's a place I go to on Sabbath. In my case, the church is my employer. We often evaluate the church in terms of what it does for me. The pews in the church are uncomfortable. Like an airplane, there are not enough aisle or window seats. The pastor speaks too long. The fellowship meals are good, and so on. And we all remember things that people have said to us about what the church means to them. And perhaps we too have participated in describing what the church means to us. 
But we also need to be thinking not only of what the church does for me, but what the church does for God. For the church is His creation, brought into being in this world for His purposes. And I'd like to discuss those with you this morning. You know, some weeks ago, I was in a city. Meetings that I was attending had ended early in the afternoon. My departure was early the next morning, and so I had time to go for a walk in this city, a city that I did not know very well. It so happened that I ended up walking down a fairly major transportation artery in the city, and as I walked along, I noticed that there were several churches along this street. So I made a little test for myself. I would look as far ahead as possible, and when I saw a church building, I would try to uh, determine in my mind what faith community worshipped in that place long before I could see the sign that identified the denomination that worshipped there. Now, I will not tell you the score of that examination. It is nothing that I can be proud of. But I well remember one church building that was readily recognizable from a distance. It was a tall structure, beautiful architecture, a, a building of huge sandstone blocks. A tall building, a steep roof, a steeple reaching into the sky, it seemed, stained glass windows, huge double-arched door at the front of the church. And I, I determined in my mind that I knew what denomination built the church and worshipped there. I was absolutely certain of it. So as I approached the property, I began looking for a sign a sign that would be at the edge of the property where cars drive in. In fact, possibly two signs because it was a fairly large property. This sign that I was looking for would be built of sandstone block. It would have some corresponding architecture to the building. But as I approached the property, I did not see a sign. This troubled me, so I began to look at the building itself. Was there on that tall front face of the building the name of the church carved into the stone? I saw no name of the church. And as I was passing in front of the building itself, this, this puzzled me, and I, I stopped just to look around the whole property, where was the identification for this property's owners? And then I saw it. It was not a sign couched in sandstone. It was simply a sheet metal sign standing perpendicular to the road in front of the door of the church. It said, this was a boxing academy, basic and advanced. And my mind started doing exactly what your mind is doing at this point. I wondered, how can a place dedicated to worship become a place dedicated to conflict? My mind went through several scenarios, the best of which was that this faith community in this particular city wanted to build a place for communal worship. They were so God-honoring and so service-oriented that the congregation grew 
and grew and grew some more until the place was too small. And they had to find some other place to worship. And because in the United States these days, the place to look for money is in the sports industry. They sold to a sports franchise and moved somewhere else. When I was finished with my walk I, and came back to the room, I immediately went onto the internet and began to search for the story about a church that has become a boxing academy. I have not found that story, but my mind frequently goes back to that moment of wondering what happened to that church. Did it find its purpose? Or did it lose its purpose? Is it possible that the members of that church, after having built such a beautiful edifice, became so internally focused that they began to quibble over the color of the carpet and the length of the sermons and the orthodoxy of the members until gradually the congregation fragmented and disappeared. I, I have no idea. But it causes me to think about the purpose of the church in the mission of God. I would like to consider with you four dimensions of that purpose. The first, the purpose of the church is to bring attention to God. Attention to God. Not to itself, not to its institutions, not to its programs, not to its size, but to bring attention to God. This is a theme in Scripture. It's in that text we read from Paul and his writings to the Ephesians that God might be made known by the church. It's a theme in Scripture. You remember the words of Jesus when he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Paul said it again in Colossians, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it again in Galatians. You read about this theme in the Old Testament from Isaiah chapter 42. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, and those who sit in darkness from the prison house. One of my favorite pictures in the Old Testament comes from the prophet Zechariah. It's a picture about evangelism. It's a picture of mission and witness. Zechariah spoke and wrote to his people at a time when they had sort of lost their identity. They, they had come through decades of persecution, decades of bewilderment, and Zechariah was trying to ignite in their imaginations what God really wanted them to be and do. And so he writes in the eighth chapter of his message, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you. Because we have heard that God is with you. What a marvelous picture that conjures up in my mind. It's evangelism. It's good news that is embodied 
It's a way of life, a thing that is plain for all to see. What surprises me is that it is the evangelized, not the evangelists, that are doing the talking. Let us go with you, they say. They take the initiative and they come from every tribe and tongue and nation. The purpose of the church is to bring attention to God. Now, at some point this morning, of the 19 people in the gospel band, 13 wear glasses. And at last, a Canadian feels he is in the majority. Thirteen wear glasses. Now, the purpose of glasses is not to be seen, but to facilitate clarity of sight. The church is like a pair of glasses for the world. It is the lens through which the world is able to see a clear picture of God. For how will the world ever come to believe in a God it cannot see? Lavish in mercy, abundant in grace, committed to reconciliation, to restoration. How will the world ever believe in a God like that unless there is a church that is the object lesson for them, for it to behold? The church is the lens through which the world gets a clear picture of God. What might happen in our faith community if the world really did see the dramatic difference that God makes in all human relationships? Is it right to expect that as a result of Jesus in their lives, the people of God, your church, my church, would be the happiest group on the planet, the healthiest group in the world, the helpingest community in the environment, the most peaceful of all people. What if the world saw that in my church? Would it not be, somewhat like in the days of Jesus, they would break down the roof to get in because they want what God offers? I have said that it is a theme in Scripture, that the purpose of the church is to bring attention to God. Incidentally, it is also a theme in the writings of Ellen White. And there are numerous references we could give. But let me just quote two very short sentences. The Christian's mission in the world is to reveal the character of Christ. That's it. By word and deed... We are to reveal Jesus to the world. So our first dimension about the mission of God and the purpose of the church is to understand that we are to bring attention to God. The second dimension of the purpose of the church is to be a classroom for discipleship training. You know, one of the main emphases we make in the proclamation of the gospel is that God in Jesus Christ has forgiven our sins. Isn't that a marvelous message to celebrate every day? But we must never stop there. 
What we really need to be proclaiming, as well as demonstrating, is that the salvation offered to us, provided for us, is salvation from the dominance of sin. Jesus died not only to save us from the punishment of our sins, but from our sins. He died in order to deliver us from a self-centered way of thinking. And the discipling role of the church is to help us understand that the gospel is not just a set of beliefs, but a power that changes us profoundly and continually. It is a classroom for discipleship training. I trust that you understand how this happens. Because one makes a decision, perhaps a decision up here in the mind, you know, to, to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in life. The effect of that decision doesn't stay in the mind. It becomes a wave that works its way through a person's body. And one who rejoices about the forgiveness of sins in the past learns about how to strive to live above the power of sin in the present. And that one decision in my life to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ soon becomes a decision that affects my ears, my eyes, my mouth, my speech, my food, my hands, my fingers, my feet, my whole body. The church is to be a classroom for discipleship training. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we come with our all. And then we learn what it means to be transformed in our all. You know, there was a, a writer, David Foster Wallace, no longer living, a young man in the United States who was, who was rumored to become one of the great writers of our time, a brilliant mind, a capacity to use the English language in a stunning way to capture ideas and to rivet thoughts in people's minds. He was an atheist, but a very celebrated writer, frequent contributor to the New York Times. Unfortunately, David Foster Wallace also suffered from severe depression Maybe that's something we need to talk about sometime in our church, but not this morning. Unfortunately for him, something got mixed up in his medications, and at the age of 28, he committed suicide. But a couple of years before he did this, he was invited to speak at a graduation at Kenyon College, a, a, a public institution, a very famous public institution in the United States. And here is a paragraph from the graduation address by an atheist. He says, everybody worships the only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. You will never feel you have enough. 
If you worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing on your body, you will die a million deaths before you take your last breath. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. The insidious things about these forms of worship is that they're unconscious. This is how we are wired. There may be a compelling reason for worshiping a God. That's quite a speech from an atheist. It works well in church, doesn't it? Because it speaks to us about the human nature. And it speaks to us about how the church is to be a classroom for discipleship training. And when we come to the church that we recognize we come from all directions of the compass, we come from every pathway in life, and no two of us are at the same point in the spiritual journey. So, brother and sister, have compassion on brother and sister and encourage them on their journey of transformation. I belong to a small church. One of the young ladies in that small church became pregnant. When her baby was about to be born, a number of the church members wondered if it was appropriate for the church to have a baby shower for this young lady. She was not married. I think they resolved it. They were generous to her. I teach a class of teenagers in my church when I'm home. Very few Sabbaths a year, but I teach a class of teenagers. And one day, just out of the sake of having some discussion with them, I said, you know, what would you like to see different about the church, about this church? How could this church... present a clearer picture of Jesus Christ. I had no particular thing in my memory to focus on that day. But after a moment or two of silence, one of the young teenagers in that class said, I wish my church could be more gentle with people who make mistakes. Tell you, that is a difficult message to hear. When you are an elder in the church, you know, when you're one of the officers, the purpose of the church is to be a classroom for discipleship training where people who come in the door enter on the pathway of discipleship. And they find through their journey the struggles and the failures, the successes, the joys and the growth to which God invites them and for which the fellowship of faith inspires them. We've said that the purpose of the church is first of all to bring attention to God, secondly, to be a classroom for discipleship training, thirdly, 
and this is where it gets difficult. The purpose of the church is to demonstrate how redeemed people live in community. The purpose of the church is to illustrate to the world an alternative society where there is justice and mercy, where there is community and service and love and joy and hope. For the truth of the gospel is that the wholeness which God is working to achieve is never complete in an individual. It is only complete through individuals learning to live together as one body, each supplying the deficiency of others. I said this is where it becomes difficult. Because we live in an age that has so idolized individualism. And one can so separate himself or herself from others as to think to live a life wholly dedicated to God but out of touch with other people. But the church is called to be a new kind of community. You know, the people of God in Bible times, I, I, I think they, they fell victim to a one-sided view of mission. Spiritual religion flourished amidst social decay. You know, Jesus talked about this when he said that people so-called supposed worshipers of God can be like whited sepulchers. They can have a, a clear and appealing exterior. But inside, be occupied by decay. The church is called to be an alternative community in the world, a place that is cross-cultural, multicultural, countercultural, and transculture, transcultural, a place where the upside-down priorities of the Beatitudes operate, where service counts, not status, where humility replaces hubris. where love is demonstrated rather than lust, and where collaboration replaces competition. The church is called to be a new community. Paul's admonition to the churches under his care embraced new dimensions of every human relationship. Husband and wife, parents and children, employers and employees, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, wise and otherwise. All were to find new relationships. That is the task of living as the church. The fourth purpose of the church is to be a healing and reconciling presence in the world. Is it perhaps true that Seventh-day Adventists tend to retreat from the world rather than engage in it? There is a sense in which we are called out of the world indeed, but we are also sent into the world. And Jesus is our model of service and ministry. 
we find in the methods of Jesus that the whole spectrum of society received his attention and care. The wealthy and the destitute, children and adults, men and women, Israelites and foreigners. But among all those with whom Jesus came in contact, he appears to have a special regard for the least, the last, the lost, the lowest, and the left out. He gave attention to those most overlooked by society, children, the poor, the sick, those maimed or mentally challenged, and sinners of the worst kind. In the minds of many, his reputation was sullied by the time and attention he gave to those that society had marginalized. He ministered to the demon-possessed and the disfigured. He healed withered limbs and wounded spirits. The blind, the deaf, and the dumb were recipients of his tender mercies. Jesus identified with human need. You remember his words, those shocking, those puzzling words. He describes how it will be in the end of time. He says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You see, it has been a weakness of religion, perhaps throughout many centuries, that religion, that people care more for religion than for humanity. Christ cared more for humanity than for religion. Or perhaps we need to say that his care for humanity was the chief expression of his religion. The purpose of the church is to be a healing presence in the community in the name of Jesus. You know, there are two ways of falling short in our understanding of mission. One is to concentrate on its spiritual significance and marginalize the political, the economic, and social dimensions. That's one way of falling short. The other is to concentrate so much on political, economic, and social dimensions that the spiritual dimension is lost sight of. May it be that God gives us a knowledge of how to keep these in balance. For God's mission involves the restoration of all that was true about his whole creation and the eradication of all evil that has worked its way into the world. Our mission has to be as comprehensive in scope as the gospel that the whole Bible gives to us. We must be careful lest we buy into the idea that the markers of religious life are Bible study and prayer and witnessing. This is an incomplete list. What is missing is service. Getting involved in the community. What an inspiring report this morning 
from the young people involved in Storm Coal. I wish and I hope that they will inspire the whole church of all ages of membership to get involved in Storm Coal. For that is what the church is called to be. There is the possibility that we can think that our highest service to God is to come to church on Sabbath morning in my dry clean suit, carrying the holy book, the hymn book, and the pocket book. But I think, if I understand Scripture and the ministry of Jesus, Our highest service to God is what I do for others. We often take pride in our worship services and in our lifting up of God. Then I read from Hosea chapter 6 where the Lord says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And I read from Amos chapter 5. This is, the most, this is the most, one of the most troubling chapters in the whole Bible for me. Verse 21 Amos says, and this is God speaking, I hate, I, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. You know, the verses before this in Amos talked about the injustice that was practiced Sunday to Friday in the community, and Sabbath was reserved for worship. How the poor were neglected, how people were so focused on acquisitions and personal advancement that they lost sight of the needs of others. This is the indictment of the prophet. Now I realize one must be careful in making exact correlations between society of Bible times and society of today. But I would also realize that even in our day, in our day of social welfare and of government and taxes to look after the needs of people, there are still marginalized people in society. And we face an epidemic across societies and generations of loneliness and brokenness and hopelessness. And these are the people that we are called to serve in Jesus' name. It was 20th century theologian Paul Tillich who said, really, that there are three great anxieties of civilization. The fear of guilt, the fear of death, and the fear of meaninglessness. Now, it seems to me that the gospel message that we find in Scripture is the perfect answer to those hungers and those fears. And the role of the church, the purpose of the church, is to get out of the church and into the community and to serve people, to be sensitive to their needs and bring them healing and hope, and a sense of belonging. 
We have been talking about the purpose of the church. First of all, to bring attention to God. Secondly, to be a classroom of discipleship training. Thirdly, to be an alternative community, to be the redeemed community in the world that shows the world how people can learn to live together. And fourthly, that the purpose of the church is to partner with God in His grand mission for the world in reconciliation, in restoration, and recovery. For how will the world ever come to believe in a God it cannot see? A God who is rich in mercy, lavish in grace, committed to reconciliation and restoration, how will the world ever believe in a God like that until there is a church that demonstrates it? I believe that's our challenge in these closing days of earth's history, to bring a picture of God that the world so desperately needs to see. There's a marvelous story that comes to us down through the centuries of Christian history. This one coming out of the late part of the third century, early part of the fourth century. It's about one of the uh, you know, great Christian theologians in Christian history, Basil the Great. Anyone who studies uh, Christian history will come across that name and recognize the marvelous influence, the, the penetrating influence that Basil the Great had on Christian theology. We owe to him, uh, in fact, although that's not the purpose of this illustration, we owe to him much of our understanding and current teaching about the Trinity. Basil the Great had a brother named Gregory. Basil the Great was the bishop and he arranged for his brother Gregory to be the bishop of Cappadocia. Cappadocia in those days was a small, out-of-the-way city, not on any one of the great thoroughfares of transportation and commerce. And Gregory was quite disappointed about being assigned to Cappadocia. So he came to his brother Basil and he said, would it be possible since you, you have the authority to make all of these assignments, would it be possible for you to appoint me as bishop to some bigger place, to some place that has more significance, to some place that, uh, that is known and, and, and you know, has some status to it Basel thought about it for a little while, and then he said to his brother Gregory, I do not want you to get distinction from your work. I want you to bring distinction to it. What a penetrating challenge that is for God's people today to not be concerned about where we are assigned or where we are placed, but to recognize that wherever God has placed us, He has also called us. And our service to Him, our highest service to Him, is not in the intensity of our worship, but in the intentionality of our living to bring Him glory. May that be your blessing and your future. And now in the assurance that God goes before you, I invite you to go from the place of worship with peace, with joy, and with courage.
Go and live in this world is a sign that those who trust in God are so freed from self and the world that they can live for others in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in the knowledge that he who called you accompanies you in your journey. And though your pathway involves toil and danger, he will bring you home safely. Go in the peace and power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.